So welcome everyone. Um, and you probably also got a little pop out window here saying that the session is going to be recorded. Um, welcome to the inaugural seminar for the Department of Clinical Pharmacy Practice. Um, my name is Alex Chen and I'm currently the founding chair for the department. And it is truly my great honor to serve as the host for today's seminar. Now it was, I think about two years ago, exactly two years ago, in fact, when I joined UCI. And one of the tasks on my to-do list is to establish a seminar series within UCI that is dedicated in pharmacy practice and clinical pharmacy. Um, I had that scribbled down on my, on my notebook and I still see it today. And I'm finally checking that off. The goal for this seminar series, which I wanted to establish is to talk about pharmacy practice and clinical pharmacy with the target, ta target audience in mind, which includes faculty and staff of the School of Pharmacy and Ph Pharmaceutical Sciences, pharmacists and also pharmacy technicians from my health system, and also our student pharmacists who have just joined us in their professional journey. Um, so it is a, a huge task in my opinion, and I think it is extremely important because I uh, wanted to use this opportunity to get us together as a community. So for the very first year of the seminar and that we are finally establishing in 2022, and since many of us from the School of Pharmacy are still relatively new to the College of Health Sciences, um, it would make perfect sense for us to invite our distinguished colleagues from the School of Medicine, from, from the School of Nursing, from Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute, and also the Program in Public Health to present topics to us, to us at pharmacy, which will help to stimulate interprofessional collaboration between pharmacy and the respective school or program. Basically, in short, I hope that this seminar series will create an opportunity for UCI pharmacy so that we get to know our neighbors and friends within the College of Health, Health Sciences better, at least to start. So this is why we're all here today. And I, again, want to welcome all of you for taking time to join us on the seminar. Uh, this is gonna be a five monthly sort of series to start. Um, and we're very excited that we're having our very first speaker for today. Just some very quick logistics and housekeeping. Our speaker will be speaking approximately 30 to 35 minutes. And after that, we'll have ample of time for Q and A. So I would urge you to hold off your questions until the very end of the seminar. Um, but with great honor that I actually get to invite our speaker, our inaugural seminar is Dr. Pranav Patel. Um, and thanks Dr. Patel for accepting my invite. He's currently the chief of division of cardiology at UCI. He's a clinical professor of medicine and also an adjunct professor of biomedical engineering at UC Irvine. He's also the director of the cardiac catheterization laboratory. Uh, lots and lots of achievements on his CV. And I'm so looking forward to hear what he's going to tell us today. The title of his seminar today is Cardiology and Pharmacy, a Collaboration of Discovery, Teaching, and Healing. So let's all welcome Dr. Patel. It's all yours, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, it's an honor, actually, um, to be invited for this inaugural talk. And, uh, um, you know, uh, a lot of respect to uh, our uh, other healthcare professionals, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians. I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, let's see if we can get started here. Are you able to see this? Yes, very yeah. well, thank you. Okay, so really, um, you know, I think I think this uh, as an inaugural talk is really to get future pharmacists and, and current pharmacists uh, interested in cardiovascular medicine. This is really the, the goal here. And also to, to let individuals know that what I've found and what I think really exists is that you're only gonna have success with collaboration, okay? And so when it means collaboration, we in the hospital work as a healthcare team, 
And without that team, we won't succeed. And uh, there is a space and an important space in that team uh, for people who specialize in pharmacy. And um, with my goal, there, there are so many different aspects of pharmacy. With my goal is to get people interested in cardiovascular medicine and cardio, uh, cardiovascular pharmacy, uh, which I think uh, hopefully by the end of this case, some people will be interested, but I think there's a great future in this. So we'll, um, we'll get going and, and talk a little bit. These are some of the objectives and I hope I can finish this in about 30, 35 minutes. We'll talk a little bit about the prevalence of heart disease and why you know, it's gonna be an important facet of uh, future uh, healthcare, if not obviously very important at this moment in time. Um, and I really want you know, people who study and specialize in pharmacy to sort of identify and understand the different aspects of cardiovascular medicine and why cardio, cardiology pharmacy will be important in the future. I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about some of the disease states that I've put down there. Um, if you understand cardiovascular disease, then I think that you would be really uh, interested in investigating it and investigating the role of the pharmacist in cardiovascular medicine. And that role will encompass patient care, but also research and education. That's gonna be important in your career as well. And it's really essential for all healthcare professionals, especially pharmacists, you know, in your future career, you have to sort of satisfy your professional development, okay? So this is a way to think about cardiovascular medicine. Is this in your future? So I'd like to hopefully at least give you a little taste uh, with regard to this. Now, before we started the seminar, we were talking a little bit about COVID-19 and you know, I have to say a few words here. Um, we're undergoing another surge. I can't remember if this is the third or the fourth, but we're undergoing another surge at this moment in time. And we've been very successful. We had an internal uh, sort of Department of Medicine uh, Division Chiefs meeting last night. And uh, from what I could see, you know, in terms of academic medical centers, I was really pleased to see that UC Irvine actually ranked number one in terms of the care and um, you know uh, the results we had in, in uh, treating COVID patients, and when we combined all medical centers in this country, we we're in the top seven percent. And again, this is a response to COVID nineteen, which is a team response. If you go to the medical center, you'll see that the pharmacists are an essential component of that team. So sort of keep that in mind. Well, what about the, the prevalence of heart disease? Um, you can see that in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, about 12.4 million individuals were, uh, had some sort of diagnosis of heart disease. In 2015, we're looking at doubling that of about 25 million. Um, so, you know, this becomes an essential component of, of how we manage patients in the future. It's gonna affect, um, um, about 50, it causes about 50% of all deaths in the US. Um, about a million and a half individuals are uh, affected when it comes to acute myocardial infarctions on an annual basis. And uh, coronary artery disease affects uh, uh, somewhere in the region of 11 to 15 million people every year. Um, when we look at uh, the causes of death, heart disease uh, really, um, I don't know if we want to be at the top of this list, but uh, you know, for all deaths uh, combined, heart disease really is up top there. And uh, when you combine cancers, it's, uh, you know, more people die of heart disease than um, any other illness. Um, so that's where, there's an importance in terms of cardi cardiology pharmacy. And, you know, I, I was a practicing pharmacist before I went to medical school. Um, and cardiology pharmacist did not, pharmacy did not exist at that moment in time. And maybe if it did, maybe my career would have been quite different. Um, I had an interest in cardiovascular medicine. Um, and that's why I pursued uh, uh, medicine. But there are things that are available at this moment in time with extra training 
that a pharmacist can do and would be essential to any sort of cardiovascular team uh, when it comes to ambulatory and inpatient practice. Um, and given the prevalence, you know, the tackling cardiovascular disease becomes something that's important nationally as well as globally. Um, we need to tackle it. Uh, we need to fight this. Um, and so um, every member of that team is essential. Um, pharmacists play a large part in this. Uh, they play a large part with our heart failure team, with our inpatient rounding. And as you'll see also with our ambulatory care practice, uh, in order to do this, you have to realize with, the, uh, with any field, for any healthcare professional, you have to sort of garner these skills. You have to, uh, you know, have this knowledge so that you can manage these patients. Um, this is a vision statement that I present uh, when I talk about the division of cardiology. But I just wanted to point out a few things. You know, first of all, we, our goal here uh, in the division of cardiology is, is to, to have sort of uh, what I uh, noted as an unparalleled parallel research driven, driven and team approach. And that team approach is important. That does not mean fellows and attendings in cardiology. That means physicians, nursing staff, technicians, pharmacists. And we try to provide that with the most technologically advanced and compassionate care. And at the same time, we try to promote superb education, not only for future cardiologists, we have a fellowship here, but for other healthcare professionals. So, you know, this vision has changed, but as vision has changed to encompass uh, the fact that this is a collaborative effort. Um, and. Uh, you know, maybe I should change this because collaborative effort to include patients as well. We'll talk a little bit about coronary heart disease. Um, you know, as a, you know, an interventional cardiologist, you know, this is my bread and butter, I suppose, but, um, but you know, 50% of, uh, of Americans have some sort of cardiovascular disease. This includes coronary heart disease or coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke, hypertension, um, and this is about 121 uh, to 122 million people in 2016. Um, coronary artery disease affects about 12 million Americans. Um, this was a comment uh, from a, a famous individual when they were just before they were uh, prescribed or di uh, diagnosed with uh, coronary heart disease. And the comment was, you know, I just had a feeling a couple of days ago, uh, I had to have my heart checked. And when I, finally, when I finally got some tightness in my chest. And we did this angiogram and found out I had blockages that were too significant to open and put a stent in. And we had to do whole bypass surgery. So this is that individual who made those comments. Now, when I say this is that this, you know, uh, Bill Clinton was diagnosed with coronary artery disease a few years after he left the office of the president. Um, but during the time that he was president, he had a stress test every year and it was normal every year. And then a couple of years after he left office, he was suddenly diagnosed with significant coronary artery disease that he needed bypass surgery. So if, if, if this individual who gets the best care, the best physicians in the country and they're not able to diagnose coronary heart disease until it's a little too late. And it's a little too late by the time you need bypass surgery, what hope is there for the rest of us? Okay, so sort of keep something in mind. When I saw this slide, uh, I talked to people, I tell people that he was lucky because there are individuals who are much more unlucky than him because he had stable coronary artery disease. There are under individuals who have unstable atherosclerosis. Um, uh, these may not be familiar to all of you guys, certainly familiar to me. There was an individual by the name of Tim Russett, uh, NBC News show. He had a normal stress test. Then sometime later, had some chest pain in his office and died in his office. He had, he had a heart attack and an arrhythmia and did not recover. More familiar would be 
James Gandolfini, who was in The Sopranos. And I think vacationing in Italy with his son um, and was found, uh, uh, had passed in his hotel room. And again, arrhythmia from ruptured plaque and undiagnosed coronary heart disease. So these were unlucky individuals compared to Bill Clinton. He survived and, and was able to be treated. Someone like Tim Russ had had a normal stress test, but still wasn't able to, we weren't able to make that diagnosis and, tr and treat him and prevent death. So what we know with coronary heart disease is that we have a normal vessel with a normal lumen. And then you can have minimal coronary artery disease, which is about 30% uh, blockage from plaque, but the lumen stays the same size. The artery uh, gets bigger. This is a uh, positive remodeling. Then you can have 50% plaque and the lumen still stays the same. The stress test is normal. But I, you know, I, I, I guarantee anyone who's diagnosed with 50% stenosis would like to be on statins and you would like to have that diagnosis and you would be watching your diet, you would be exercising. But this would be a normal study and most people are asymptomatic. It's not until you get 70% or more uh, uh, plaque burden that you get compromise on the lumen because of this positive remodeling. This is called uh, Gragov's hypothesis. And this is, this is actually stable plaque. This is what happens. This is what happened to Bill Clinton. He had uh, compromise of uh, uh, his lumen eventually and had symptoms, but by then he had more than 70% stenosis. Uh, when it, probably when he was in, in the office of uh, the presidency, he had 50% stenosis in a normal study and, uh, and um, normal stress test. Now he had bad habits. I mean, he did run, but he used to run to McDonald's and back and things like that. So he had a, he had a, had a poor diet, but I'm sure had he known he had 50% stenosis, he would not have been, uh, um, his diet would not have been what it was. And, and to tell you the truth, we, we actually had the pleasure of treating him recently and a much changed individuals. Now he's actually part of the team that took care of him and is a complete vegan, lost a lot of weight and uh, does a tremendous amount of exercise now. So, so this is what we know about <clears throat> coronary artery disease and we're still learning more. The stable plaque, you know, has a small lipid core and a thick fibrous cap. And this slowly progresses until you have symptoms and then until you get uh, treated either with stenting or bypass surgery. The unstable plaque, you have a large amount of lipid and a thin fibrous cap. <clears throat> and you don't need too much compromise on that lumen to, to cause problems. Uh, this is the type of plaque that causes the sudden or acute myocardial infarction. And this plaque ruptures at the shoulders for men and you get then anitis for thrombus formation and complete occlusion of the artery. This is what causes the acute MI. And actually for women, it's, it's quite different. It's a different mechanism. It's rather than plaque rupture, it's plaque erosion. We just still don't understand what, what causes this. And this is a, a little video showing plaque erosion, sorry, plaque rupture at the shoulder of the plaque, not really compromising the lumen too much, plaque ruptures, and then the lipid goes downstream, but it acts as a thrombus, uh, as acts as a nidus for thrombus formation that uh, causes the vessel to occlude. And on the top left corner, the green line is actually um, sinus rhythm going into ventricular fibrillation. And this is what kills people. Okay, this is what happened to those two individuals who had, um, had unstable plaque. So when I in the cath lab and I opened a vessel for an individual who had an acute myocardial infarction, that infarction was caused by a 30 to 50% stenosis. That would have caused a normal stress test, okay? And probably the lack of symptoms. So, and everyone, every adult has unstable and stable plaque. An unstable plaque, plaque ruptures now and then. Most of the time we don't notice, okay? And really the, the, one of the only medicines which will help stabilize plaque is statin drugs. Now in the cath lab, you know, on the left you see um, an angiogram. This is what uh, I do. And you see uh, four different levels in the vessel, A, B, C, and D. They look normal on an angiogram. When you look inside the vessel, 
you can see that uh, uh, using an ultrasound, there's actually, it's not normal uh, as, as shown by the angiogram, but you have plaque going down the vessel from A down to D. So an angiogram is not sufficient. There are other ways that we try to check and see what's going on. And uh, we can actually use virtual histology now to show what's going on with the plaque. Um, the white is sort of fibrous plaque. Um, and when you see red, that means a lot of lipid uh, and you could have ne necrotic tissue in there. And that's more vulnerable plaque. And it, I think it changes your management. If you see, you know, the lumen not compromised, but a lot of vulnerable plaque, you certainly would be putting that individual on statin drug therapy. So coronary artery disease, you know, is a little bit more complex. Now CT has come a long way. And uh, on the right, uh, um, under B, you can see a CT scan with some, that's the uh, LAD, left anterior descending artery with some compromise of the lumen. Uh, CT scanning can now uh, sort of show positive remodeling. It can show calcification soft plaque, fibrous plaques, it's come a long way. It's a good study, not still the gold standard, but it's getting better. So our imaging uh, modalities, our imaging capabilities are getting better uh, when we start diagnosing coronary heart disease. These are some of the medicines we have to deal with, um, whether it be antihypertensives, uh, there's a nursing mnemonic for when someone has an acute myocardial infarction, uh, medications taken when someone has uh, coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease may, may sometimes lead to uh, uh, congestive heart failure and a cardiomyopathy. You can see it's getting more and more complex. That's why um, this is a sort of a very small role, but an important role that pharmacists play when it comes to medical management of our patients. <clears throat> it's hard enough to understand you know, the speciality, my speciality coronary heart disease, but now we have specialities of heart failure, electrophysiology, structural heart disease. There's a lot going on. So an essential component of that team is the pharmacist. <clears throat> Our pharmacists are involved not only in inpatient, but our ambulatory care. Research becomes important. And look, I, I have to say that one of your faculty actually reached out to me a few months ago Dr. Zaki, and she came and she rounded with us, <clears throat> spent time in the cath lab, and actually now um, has been involved uh, uh, um, with some research which she and her team is doing in terms of thromboembolic events in non-hospitalized COVID patients. They're looking at a, a, a registry or a database from uh, the University of California, Irvine. So there's sorry, the University of California as a whole. And so there's some important information, important research being done. So this is not all clinical practice. Research should be part of what you should be concentrating on, certainly uh, with your education and then possibly in the future. And with research comes quality initiatives. There's always room to improve. And, um, you know, she was looking at our a database for coronary heart disease in the cath lab. And I'm hoping uh, with continued involvement from pharmacy that we get improvement in our quality initiatives for patients, patient care. Now, education for pharmacists and nurses and physicians is also important. We actually, just with her rounding for a couple of days, got some inf important information on how we manage our patients. So again, an important aspect of our team and, um, even cardiovascular or, or cardiology pharmacy becomes very subspecialized. Keep that in mind. Structural heart disease, aortic valve stenosis. Um, when you have severe aortic valve stenosis, um, the chance of death or chance of survival is very low, even compared to um, most cancers. And up to 7% of the population over the age of 65 has this disease. If we leave them alone, the chance that someone dies over the next um, five years is, is close to 50% over the next, sorry, over the next two years is close to 50%, over the next five years is 80%. So um, not, not a, a, a good prognosis if you have severe, severe aortic stenosis. I'm gonna move forward with this um, 
animation here, but we have non-surgical valve replacement now. And it's a team effort, again, not only, only involving cardiologists, uh, radiologists, anesthesiologists, uh, uh, surgeons, but nursing staff, um, pharmacists. Um, so here you can see, you know, how we, from the femoral artery, replace the aortic valve. So for someone who is a non-surgical candidate, and I have to say today, I just did an angiogram this morning on a 94-year-old individual who has severe aortic valve stenosis. I don't really look forward to putting a valve in a 94-year-old individual, but remember severe aortic stenosis, the chance of her dying over the next two years um, is pretty high. Um, this is one of our first valve procedures. This is a balloon going up uh, across a stenotic valve. We just open up the valve a little bit. And this is deployment of um, a, a, a bioprosthetic valve um, in the aortic valve area. And this takes about six seconds. We rapid pace the heart at 180 beats a minute. Um, this is just this year overtaken surgical valve replacement. And this is what the valve looks like. So rather than spending five days in the hospital recovering from stenotomy, uh, people either spend one or two days in the hospital, they have a little suture in the femoral artery and that's it, they walk in the next day. But again, you know, the success of this would not have occurred if it wasn't for, uh, for a team effort. And that comes from all sides. So this, this has been new for us over the last three years, um, but suddenly, uh, I'd like you to see what goes on in terms of um, cardiovascular medicine. Mitral regurgitation, leaking of the mitral valve, it's actually more common than um, aortic valve stenosis. And actually we fix this through the femoral vein. I'm gonna really rapidly go through this. But femoral vein into the right atrium, we puncture the right atrium into the left atrium. That's that puncture, okay? And you can see that's, that mitral valve, okay? Now we're gonna clip that. We're gonna use a little, like a staple, okay? And I'm gonna staple to bring those leaflets together. I wanna go really fast to this. The blue flame is the leaking of blood. But this is, this is what happens. We grab those leaflets, and the photograph on the right is, is, is the equipment. We maneuver this outside the, uh, the patient's body. And we're looking at ultrasound and fluoroscopy on screens in front of us. And when we've sort of stapled those leaflets together, we let go of this clip. Everything comes out. And again, a couple of sutures in the femoral vein. And uh, actually, most people leave the next day. Um, and this would have been open heart surgery. Um, so cardiovascular medicine, as I said, has come a, a long way. And now with these non-surgical procedures, we find ourselves in the forefront of many cardiac procedures. And, and um, this graph really, the, 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 the columns in the red are, are the numbers needed to treat patients with heart failure, using medicines really. And um, the green column, shows uh, the mitral clip modality on, on certain patients. These are people who have functional uh, mitral regurgitation, which is a dilated left ventricle uh, causing mitral regurgitation. But we only need to treat five patients to save one life um, compared to some of the medicines. Medicines are also very essential in how we treat these uh, patients. Um, advanced heart failure, our director is Dr. Don Lombardo. This really becomes an essential component of um, the, uh, the management of cardiovascular patients. Heart failure patients make up about 30% of the patients we see. Uh, 67 million Americans carry this diagnosis, but we think there are maybe 15 million uh, Americans who are un undiagnosed. And 50% of patients with uh, heart failure or with a heart failure diagnosis will die within the first, within the next five years. Uh, this is sort of a, uh, a really a, a list of our inpatient, outpatient heart failure service line. And I've highlighted pharmacy is, a, a, is really a, a big component here. Um, 
and our inpatient uh, our team. Pharmacy is an important aspect of our team. And our outpatient clinic, uh, there's a um, multidisciplinary uh, heart failure, advanced heart failure team. Um, it's a VAD team, which is a ventricular assist device team and it includes a pharmacist. Um, and this is something new that we've bought. This is very unique to Orange County. We're the only institution in Orange County and we're proud to be the only academic center in Orange County, which has now surgical uh, ventricular assist devices, okay? Or, or uh, a VAD or left ventricular assist device, LVAD. This is a mini pump that is surgically implanted in the heart for people with heart failure. Why do we do this? Well, every year there's about 700,000 cases of heart failure. And less than 10% of this, these individuals will benefit from transplant. You can see from 1988 to 2017, really um, there was an initial increase, but transplants have plateaued. There are not enough hearts. We will never have enough hearts, even though we're implanting pig hearts in people. I think that was in the news yesterday. Um, we'll never have enough hearts for the amount of patients. And um, there's a comment that proposing heart transplantation to cure heart failure is analogous to proposing the lottery to cure poverty. It's not gonna work. Um, so these devices have come a lot way. Uh, when I was training as a medical student, it used to be the size of a six foot refrigerator, um, this assist device or, or, or really this device here that they had to carry with them or roll with them. But now surgically implanted, uh, people can have um, a pretty autonomous, independent life. Um, and they're implanted in many ways. There's an open stenotomy, but our surgeons are able to, without opening up the, the sternum here, are able to make two small, smaller incisions and sort of insert this mini pump. And again, it's sort of a back, a back pack, which is a battery pack, and the patients can have a fairly normal life. Now, this can be a bridge to transplant, but it's also something called a destination therapy. You may have this for the rest of your life. Okay, so these are very sick patients we're seeing now. And when you see these sick patients, obviously it makes sense why we have a, a team approach here. And patients are on multiple drugs. They may be on anticoagulation. The role of the pharmacist is essential for this team, okay? Um, during the time of COVID, we've put in um, devices which are called um, ECMO, okay? Extra uh, corporeal membrane oxygenation. Lungs don't work. So we have to bypass the lungs. And actually um, we've put in so many of these uh, uh, devices now to these COVID patients. They're, they have bilateral pneumonia, they can't breathe. So this is what's being input. This is sort of last scenario, last resort. Um, and in the cat lab, I'm actually able to put in through the femoral artery, a mini pump um, rather than a surgical pump. It doesn't work as well as a surgical pump, but these ways uh, that we help patients um, so that they, they can recover either from COVID or from you know, a, a major um, heart attack or something like that. Okay, so we've gone far and we certainly should be proud of, as to the direction of UC Irvine. And these are some of the, the awards that our advanced heart failure team has, has won. I can say, you know, honestly that this is, you know, the most unique uh, advanced heart failure team in Orange County. We offer services that no one else offers in Orange County. So uh, I, I think uh, the division or our cardiovascular service line probably ranked uh, top in Orange County. Women's heart disease. Um, these slides come from Dr. Kim. Uh, I, I uh, stole them from her, uh, but wonderful slides. And she, when she gave these talks, she, she looked at Dr. Google, she said, and just typed in having a heart attack. <laughs> And she makes a good point. You know, there's like 10 pictures and only two of the pictures have women with chest pain. It's all about men, you know? Um, and even physicians have got this wrong. You know, we've been, we've been talking about men and heart disease, uh, uh, but 
It's not a man's disease, okay? Uh, more women die from heart disease, again, than all cancers combined, okay? And um, it's the leading cause of death for, for men and women. One woman every minute will die from heart disease, okay? And, you know, I, I don't think it's that clear. And to tell you the truth, some of the data shows that if we compare 2009 to 2019, we've done worse. And not only in terms of treating women, but the awareness in the population is not there. Women are not, are not aware that heart disease impacts them more than, than cancer, okay? So the, you know, we as a healthcare team, I, I think are obliged to, to sort of educate our patients about this. So women tend to have disease um, uh, much older than men. Okay, men present much younger. Um, so women, obviously there's some protection from estrogen, but will present at, at an older age. These are some of the symptoms that women have, unusual fatigue, sleep disturbance, shortness of breath, indigestion, Chest pain is is bill is right down is below right it's it's unusual fatigue seventy percent of the time. How many times have we been told that it's you know classic symptoms of chest pain? So women tend to have sort of atypical symptoms that are ignored. Um, at the time of the heart attack, it's not chest pain; it's shortness of breath most of the time. Okay, so as physicians, uh, we need to keep this in mind. Uh, but as a healthcare team, we need to obviously make sure that our patients are aware of this. Um, so women tend to have atypical symptoms. Fewer women are um, correctly diagnosed now or compared to 10 years ago. So we've, we've done poorly. We should do better. Um, so women are less likely to be treated with the recommended therapies. They're less likely to undergo procedures to restore blood flow um, to the heart. And they tend to have more complications uh, after a procedure. We have to keep that in mind as well. And there's different types of coronary heart disease. You know, I spoke a little bit about having plaque burden, okay? We find with women, you can have spasm of the vessel that can cause issues and certainly symptoms. Women tend to have more diffuse uh, plaque burden, okay, rather than these uh, these uh, um, localized areas where you have uh, plaque burden. Women are more likely to have spontaneous coronary artery dissection causing problems, even though this is rare, it's more likely to occur in women. And there's another thing, uh, there's something called microvascular disease. What I was showing you was looking at really the, the more larger vessels rather than, than the microvasculature. We can't even see the microvascular on angiogram, okay? And up to 50% of women with normal angiograms may have microvascular disease. It's important because many times we saw women with chest pain symptoms with a positive stress test who had a normal angiogram. And we let them go home saying that everything is normal. But we realize now that maybe we were not making the diagnosis of microvascular disease. And when you don't make that diagnosis and they still have chest pain, that chest pain is the heart complaining. There's something still going on. It's not getting enough oxygenation. And you can uh, cause arrhythmias, you can uh, cause a cardiomyopathy. So this is something unique. This is something that we certainly now uh, are more aware and make that diagnosis. So bottom line, there's a significant difference between uh, in heart disease between men and women, and that that is going to impact diagnosis, treatment, and the prognosis. Education becomes very important. Uh, okay, um, if we not only educate ourselves but educate educate our patients, then um, 80% of cardiovascular disease can be prevented. And the more we know about heart disease, the better we have of beating it. And prevention becomes very important. And my goal is to try to educate not only um, my patients, but again, um, 
our fellows and our nurses, but hopefully now um, people in the School of Pharmacy. Um, and hopefully uh, you guys realize that all team members play a role in this. You know, by the time you are practicing in the field of pharmacists, you have to know that you play a role in terms of education. Um, and that role is as important as treatment uh, when you follow these patients. These are some of the things that we offer um, within our division. I'm really not gonna go through this. I like to show this, I usually show this uh, when I'm talking to patients, but I think, uh, you know, um, I like to say that we're number one, but I wanna show you that we're number one. We have a lot of things that some of the two larger hospitals in our community don't have, you know what I mean? They may have, may have more money than we do, but we offer more services to our patients, okay? So just to finish off here, um, you know, this, as I said, cardiology pharmacist was not uh, available to me in my career as a pharmacist. And I practiced for five years um, before going to medical school. Um, it is available, it should be available to you guys in the future. So think about that. Um, it could be a very enriching uh, and fulfilling career. Um, and it's not only about um, treating patients, um, scholarship, medical writing becomes important. And if you don't do it in your career, get involved during your training, okay? To be involved in research, uh, writing papers, quality initiatives. Also keep in mind, um, certainly in cardiovascular medicine, uh, this is such a huge field. And without a team, we would not succeed. And the pharmacist is a valuable member of that team. You have a lot to offer. I have communication with the, our inpatient pharmacists on a regular basis. And really, uh, without their help, you know, we would not be successful in terms of patient care and certainly not successful in terms of uh, quality initiatives and in terms of costs as well. Um, so this is going to be important to you uh, throughout your career. And just a couple of slides now, just imagine what we can do together. Now I say this because obviously School of Pharmacy is important, but in the future, 2025, there's gonna be a new hospital there, okay? The collaboration is gonna be more important on the campus. Um, this is what it's supposed to be, uh, to look like when it's built. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, in uh, winter of 2022, there was a center, there's supposed to be a center for advanced care, which is supposed to open up. And then the, the new hospital in 2023, cardiology is gonna have a big presence there. And hopefully in the future, as your program and your clinical program develops, we'll have the ability to have rotations through cardiology, interaction with the cardiologist and uh, um, some great collaboration when it comes to, to research and, and education and patient care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, I really like the, light, the last few slides that you presented. I mean, the, the future of cardiology pharmacy and then moving into how we potentially can expand a lot of these practices at our new medical center and also in the ambul ambulatory space. Um, I, I think the opportunity is, trem is tremendous. And by that time, we probably will have our students finishing the, uh, the third year or fourth year and probably going on rotation. So perfect timing. Um, here on the Zoom call today, besides the students, we also have quite a number of pharmacists from UCI Health. Um, and again, as one entity as UCI Pharmacy, we look forward to collaborate together closely with your department and see how we can expand more services. I, I again, I really appreciate um, the thoughts that you put in for the talk. Um, I wanna open up the floor for questions um, from anybody. Um, feel free to just jump in or raise your hand. Um, you can ask questions. Yeah, Dr. Ozaki. 
Hi, Dr. Patel. Thank you for your presentation. That was really great information about the overview of cardiology and really excited to have some collaboration between pharmacy and uh, cardiology. And quick question for you that is there any lecture or education session among, in the cardiology that like, for example, like um, journal club or attending lectures or something that a pharmacist can join? Yes, yeah, so we do have didactics and lectures uh, for our fellows. They're they're open to to anyone actually. Um, and at the time of virtual meetings, it's it's very possible to 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 go to these. Um, so that that's actually a very good point. And and maybe you know some communication with the the program and and with the mm -hmm. division, we can make that available. Um, the other thing to, to probably consider the first two months of our um, academic year, we, we call a, a fellows boot camp, mm -hmm. where we give lectures uh, every day for two months for our first year for our first year fellows. And again, these are actually open to anyone who who is willing to 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 listen in. Um, that's available. Journal clubs as well. So you're right. Uh, these are available. Um, and um, maybe, you know, Dr. Chan and I can talk and, and make that available to other individuals. That'd be great. And then also maybe in the future, if there is some spot, maybe pharmacists, we can present about the medication, new update of the evidence or new guideline about the medication therapy that we can present to communicate with the cardiologist. And that might be a great opportunity for us as well. Yes, we the, these actually these bootcamp lectures uh, are um, we do we have different specialities and it could be nursing staff, mm -hmm. uh, uh, echo technologists, um, pharmacists who can give those lectures uh, much more better than than I could, you know, when <laughs> when, it, when it when it comes to their specialities. So yes, um, and then you know always remember you know we we have these monthly uh, morbidity and mortality conferences, mm -hmm. and um, now there, there's a role there. It's hard to, to come to all of these meetings, but the, the, there should be a role there for all the team to be involved. You know, if it's a if it's a if it's a heart failure patient, there's no reason why the whole heart failure team can can should not be involved with that. Now, obviously, you have you have clinical pharmacists um, working in the medical center, so there should be good collaboration there, um, uh, so that uh, the students are aware. Thank you. We should work on future rotations. You know, I, I do have a, I'm a course director for a biomedical engineering course and we have biomedical engineering uh, students rotate through the hospital. It's been difficult during the time of COVID, but we realized that once they see clinical medicine, it really opens up their world and their ideas. Yeah. You know, bench research doesn't really open up things. Um, obviously clinical rotations will be part of your educational process. So, um, you know, some sort of rotation through cardiology, I think it's going to be essential. Uh, Dr. Kadish. Hi, Dr. Patel. Thank you so much for sharing all this information with us today. I don't think we've had a chance to meet. I'm Christine Cadiz, and um, it was really great to hear you actually talk about the VAD and advanced heart failure team, because I'm currently the pharmacist on the VAD team that sees uh, patients in clinic and I work with our patients as they discharge out of the hospital too. And um, really what you said about team-based care and our advanced heart failure team, having such a unique team is very true. It really resonates with me. And I'm very grateful to be so part of such a, I think, tight knit and really impactful team. Before, I do have a question for you, but I just wanted to share some successes because you talked about the odds of receiving a heart transplant we actually have, I think, one or two members of our VAD team on the Zoom today, and uh, three of our VAD patients that were implanted at UC Irvine recently got heart transplants, and those were VAD patients that were implanted as a bridge to transplant, and our most recent patient got a transplant over the holiday break, so just wanted to share that little bit of good news to the rest of the people on the call. I'm sure, Dr. Patel, you're aware of that already. <laughs> this is uh, obviously good news, um, and you know, 
to tell you the truth, this, the, all this has been new to me over the last um, two years as we developed an advanced heart failure team. The patients are so much sicker. And if I didn't have that team, I think I'd be lost. You know, So it's, it's become so subspecialized. And when a, when a VAD patient comes to the emergency room or, or to the hospital, if I don't have that team, I want to have trouble, you know, looking after mm -hmm. patients myself. So um, it's become so subspecialized um, that you're so valuable to that team. And to tell you the truth, it makes you so valuable if you decide, okay, look, I'm, I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to move state. You know, you find yourself that much more valuable to any sort of um, hospital system. Um, so it's to your advantage, I think, if you really have an interest to sort of learn about whatever speciality, obviously in this case, cardiovascular medicine, but even to subspecialize within that, very enriching. Oh, I totally agree. And just, I have one other, a couple other comments that you mentioned that talking about developing a rotation, I'd definitely be interested in working with you and Aya at some point to help develop a really good, robust cardiovascular rotation. Uh, the question I had for you was about women in cardiovascular disease, since you were talking about how there's a high degree of unawareness of cardiovascular disease among women. So what ideas do you have for how we can educate women or have we already started increasing our screening and education efforts in the inpatient or in the ambulatory care setting? I, I think uh, certainly now as physicians and cardiovascular professions, professionals in, in cardiology, we're recognizing the problem because the, the problem was with us in the past, right? The, the, it, it began with very small trials, which were done on young Caucasian men. So now the trials are much larger. They encompass people, um, whether it be you know, gender or racial differences. So the trials are getting better. We're getting better in terms of recognizing this. And then the next thing is sort of education. Now we, we educate ourselves, we educate our peers, but now we have to start educating our, our, um, our patients. And really the only way to, to do that, and, and you know, we, we have these occasional uh, seminars, community talks and things like that, um, to tell you the truth, I, I always feel that, you know, if, if a heart failure, uh, if, if we're going to have a heart failure talk and we're going to go out in the community, say, say after COVID is done, or even a Zoom meeting, I feel it should be a heart failure team who gives that talk, you know, so a portion is, you know, the, 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 the nurse practitioner, one is the surgeon, the, the cardiologist. The pharmacist gives an input, you know, or if you're going to visit a community center, go as a team. Uh, the division itself is talking about how do we improve um, diversity and inclusion when it comes to the field of, field of cardiology. And I just had a faculty meeting last month and we asked people for ideas. And one of these things was how do we improve our message in, when it comes to women's heart disease? We have actually all of these tested. Nearly 50% of the faculty is, is women, which is very unique for an academic practice. It just doesn't happen. Um, so, so how do we do this? You know, do we, do we go to schools? Do we go to community center and give talks? Well, if you're gonna go, make sure you take um, residents and fellows, you know, make sure you take a nurse practitioner, make sure you take a pharmacist so they can see the women are, are involved with, with all aspects of uh, cardiac care. So um, first educate ourselves and then uh, we have to educate the public, you know. Uh, Thank you. I, I have one question and, uh, and hopefully it won't take more than five minutes, but I, I think it will. I mean, looking at your journey, Dr. Patel, I mean, you've done so much. Um, I mean, not just pharmacy, medicine, but even in research. Um, can, can you give us a few inspiring words about how you evolved yourself to become a clinician scientist? Like how, you know, how did you find yourself on this journey, right? Um, that you're interested in, you know, cardiovascular research. So, uh, 
Yes, initially I was interested in the clinical aspect of medicine. And you know, when, when applying to, to medical school, that's really what I wanted to focus on. And you, you know, obviously when you start doing medical school, you you don't you're exposed to so many things. You don't you don't really know. Um, it sort of continued and, and I, you know, went into residency and still wanted to do cardiology, it went into uh, cardiology and I wanted to be an interventional cardiologist to tell you the truth my first month in the cath lab I was like I can't do this people die you know what I mean so and then I realized I was actually good at doing this and and uh, and uh, then started enjoying the profession but it could change any time but what I realized when I was in medical school and not so much as undergrad but in medical school is that I'm going to be doing this for a for a short number of years, you know, this education. And I want to be exposed to it as much as possible. And research is an important part of it. If I'm never going to do research, at least I'm going to experience this. And, mm -hmm. and medical school gave me the opportunity. And then I went looking for it. You know, what was my interest? And it was cardiovascular physiology. So I went to the medical school and started working with the, the department of uh, uh, physiology. You know, and then in residency, I just sort of continued. I said, look, uh, I, I'm, I want to get into fellowship. You know, research is important. I continued Cardio cardiology research. Fellowship, it just sort of continued. And then as I, you know, practiced uh, and in academic medicine, it's important. You work at UCI, research is part of it. But I actually had an interest in coronary heart disease, intravascular imaging. I wouldn't have succeeded without collaboration from scientists on the undergraduate campus. Okay, some of the unique things that they do. Um, and then, you know, your own faculty member, it was Aya, she came to me to talk about her interests, right? I mean, uh, and so, you know, that, that initial communication was arranged and she made that effort. Um, I just, what I like to tell the students is that just try it. You know, you may not enjoy it, but you, you'll only get that one opportunity. And those who are on faculty use every opportunity. It doesn't have to be bench research. There's translational research, clinical research. You don't have to do research. The other aspect is quality initiatives. That's right. But these are going to be really important as part of your career and they will enrich your career in, in, in some way, you know, and it's gonna be beneficial to you. You just have to make that effort. I, I agree. And it's that inquisitive mind, right? I mean, I think being part of an academic medical center sort of setting, whether or not that you are seeing patients or even doing other activities that are related to patient care or even educating students, there, there will be opportunities where you know, you wanted to find out more and, and resolve some of these questions that we somehow never have answers for. Um, and I, I, I like your response, Dr. Patel, because, uh, you know, people always focus on just one aspect of research that it's basic science, but there's so many spectrums. And I think before we can just say that, you know, we don't want to do it, but I think it's important for people to know that there are a lot of different opportunities and if you don't try, you, you just don't know what you lose out. But being in this infrastructure, you know, with all the schools uh, and all the opportunities, I, I, I think it's a, an equation for success, in my opinion, if you are interested in research. Very much agree. Well, it's one o'clock. I do have a very minor request um, coming from